So today's topic is still iteration. Uh, we'll talk a l more about recursion, but we'll also talk about a different kind of iteration. So today is, wow, is it the 31st. first day? 31st. It's the 31st, OK. Last day of January. So, uh, recall that iteration means to do something over and over again. So, the, presently, the means that we talked over that we talked about last time for iteration is recursion. Okay, that is to say, you write a function that r refers to itself in its definition. So, let's talk about briefly the definition of factorial. So here's the definition of factorial that we wrote last time. So n factorial, where n is uh, a non-negative integer, we said is 1 if n is equal to 0. So it's 1 in that case. And then what is it otherwise? n times n minus 1 factorial. Correct. So n multiplied by n minus 1 factorial otherwise. Okay. <clears throat> so that's the, the definition that we wrote last time. It's standard definition in mathematics. So now I'd like for you to consider <clears throat> this, uh, so I'll call this definition 1 and definition 2 Let's look at it. I'll say n factorial is 1 if n is equal to 0. And now I'm going to change it up a little bit. I'm going to say that it's n minus 1 factorial multiplied by n otherwise. Okay, so is, is it in focus? I can't, it doesn't look like it's in focus over here. It, is it focused up, up there? Uh, we can understand it. I have a button called auto-tune. Will it change my voice if I do that? <laughs> so, oh, yeah, that's better. is that better? Okay, so here's, here's two definitions. So from, from a mathematician's point of view, from a math student's point of view, these two definitions are identical. Why are they identical? Commutative property. Right, because the commutative property of multiplication. Okay, in the end, the only difference actually is this product, right? This one we said n times n minus 1 factorial. This one we said n minus 1 factorial times n. Okay. Uh, now, let's, let's compute with them in the, just following the, the definition, and let's see what is the actual difference. What actual, what actual difference is there in the, in the usage of these two definitions? So formally, they're equivalent in the sense that they, they produce exactly the same result. But let's watch how the computation proceeds. Okay, <clears throat> so if we wanted to do, for example, 5 factorial according to this definition, well, what we would be asking is we'd be saying, okay, we're, we're computing 5 factorial. So in this expression, what is n? 5. five. So which clause are we in? The first or the second clause? Second second clause. So according to that, it would be 5 multiplied by 4 factorial. Is there any question why that's what this is saying? Okay. <clears throat> so now we're not finished because we have yet more factorials to do. So 
unwinding this definition, it would be 5 times 4 times 3 factorial, which is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 factorial, which is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 factorial, which is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 times 0 factorial. And here's the first place where it becomes different, in a sense. So what do I mean by that? No, because that's not zero. That's zero factorial. Yeah, because finally we're using the first clause, the base case. All, all of these lines before, we were using the, re the recursive clause, the clause that refers to factorial itself. Okay, now finally we're going to use this one. So this is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1 times 1. And of course that's 120. Okay. So any question about this? So now, before I write it down, can someone make a hypothesis? How will this definition, the, the actual computation, not the, not the numeric value, because if you compute 5 factorial with this one, you get 120. And if you compute 5 factorial with that one, you get 120. How will the computation look different for this one? What order? The order, of the, the order of the factors. Right. So notice that these numbers are 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and then 1 again for 0 factorial. So let's use the def this definition and see what happens. So 5 factorial, according to this definition, according to this definition, would be 4 factorial multiplied by 5. Notice the commutation. Which would be, in, in its turn, 3 factorial multiplied by 4 multiplied by 5. And in turn, <clears throat> 2 factorial multiplied by 3 multiplied by 4 multiplied by 5. Uh, 1 factorial multiplied by 2 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 4 multiplied by 5. <clears throat> 0 factorial multiplied by 1 multiplied by 2 multiplied by 3 multiplied by 4 multiplied by 5. And then 1 multiplied by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So now, <clears throat> where end results are concerned only, the results are exactly the same okay, because of the commutivity of product of the reals. Okay, but for the purposes of computation, do you see that these are qualitatively different? This one, in a sense, is counting down, and this one, in a sense, is counting up. Okay. Any question about this observation? <clears throat> Any question about it? Yes? Why does it matter? Why does it matter? Okay, so then, there's a, there's a couple reasons. So, the most, the most immediate reason to, for you uh, not you specifically, but the class, uh, is that on one of the exercises, I can't remember because they just have, they're just numbered. Maybe it's exercise seven, I don't know. It says, uh, you know, one of them it says count down from n to one, and the other one says count up from one to n. Okay, so notice that this one is counting down and this one is counting up. So that's, that's the most immediate reason for you. 
as a class. Yes? When I was doing this and it said uh, counting up, I thought it meant to go, in this case, from one, two, three, four, five. Not like the, the final ordering is uh, consecutive or anti-consecutive, but that rather than going from the largest number down to the smallest number, you must go from the smallest number down to the biggest number. Is that something else, or is that still good? As long as you evaluate evaluate them in the order requested. So, <clears throat> uh, another matter is that um, where computation is concerned, where computation is concerned, um, <clears throat> depending, on, depending on what programming language you're using, and this, this is not the case for MATLAB. This is, this is in general for other programming languages. One of these two cases will be optimized. For, for the programming language at hand. So this one uh, is referred to as a right recursion, and this one is referred to as a left recursion, because the thing, the thing that's recursive is on, happens after, and this one happens before. And in other contexts, this could be called something like a post recursion or a pre recursion. So depending on the programming language at hand, one of them will be optimized. Okay, so now let's consider for a moment. <clears throat> now here's the definition of factorial in MATLAB. Here's, here's two definitions. So one of them, so I'm going to again do two columns. function <clears throat> m equal fact n. Okay, we want to have a recursive definition of <clears throat> the factorial function. Okay, so we wrote a definition of this last time. But now I'm going to make a slightly different de uh, definition. So if, so what is, so recall that that if that I'm starting corresponds to the block structure of the definition of, of factorial. So if n equal 0, so someone tell me about what I've written. Another equal sign, yeah. Another one? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because you left that's assignment. Because <laughs> I left horizontal space. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> well, that yes, I agree with that. <laughs> also, just a it's just a reminder that in computation and in MATLAB in particular, there is a distinction between assignment and test for equivalence. In math, like in Miss Harris's seventh grade class. Assignment and equivalence are both expressed with a single equal sign. And it's a bit confusing when, when you're coming to your first programming language. <coughs> okay. In MATLAB, assignment is a single equal sign. Test for equality is a, is a doubled equal sign. <coughs> so if n is equivalent to 0, <coughs> then the output is what? 1. one. one. else <clears throat> okay <clears throat> so <clears throat> now I'm going to change the definition that we did from last time so last time I, I wrote this but I'm gonna cross this out so M is in multiplied by fact of n minus 1. So that's what we wrote last time. Okay, notice that that corresponds to this one. How could I make a definition corresponding to that one? Right, so I could just reverse them. <clears throat> okay. 
So I'm going to cross this out. Okay, so that's not what we're doing this time. <clears throat> so this time I'm going to say, okay, <clears throat> this will be, uh, I'll write K is fact in minus 1. <clears throat> And then I'll write M is what? Very good. So K times N or N times K. Either one would suffice. So any question about the definition that I have written here? Any question about it? <clears throat> okay, let's try and compute with this definition to make sure that we understand what's happening. So the reason why I'm putting a K in here is because uh, <clears throat> several students ex uh, expressed some frustration or at least not understanding about how recursion works. So what I'm doing is I put a K in here, another, so that I, when we do the table, I'll have one more column so that I can point to a specific place where K is. Okay, so in this definition, there's three variables. There's M, N, and K now. M, N, and K. So suppose Suppose that we were at the command line. So remember the double right arrow indicates being at the command line. And we type fact of five. <clears throat> okay, we type fact of five. So what MATLAB does is it takes a look at this function and says, okay, there's three variables that are in play, M, N, and K. So it creates a little place to work. M, N, and K. <clears throat> At the present time, which, which values are known? Uh, N is the only one known, yes? Right. So N is the only one known presently. <clears throat> and it is known to be 5. So what will MATLAB do in response to this? It says, okay, well, the present value of n, is it equivalent to zero? It is not equivalent to zero. <clears throat> so it will not execute this line, and it will jump into this other clause. And it will say, okay, now I'm going to define what k is. Now I'm going to define what k is. And in order to figure out what k is, I need to evaluate factorial. So it says, okay, well, in order to evaluate this value, <clears throat> I need to start a new workspace. <clears throat> and how, what variables will be in this new workspace? <clears throat> M, N, and K. And when this line executes for that value of n, it creates a new workspace. And what is the present value of n in this workspace? 4. OK, then it goes to the top of the definition. It says, well, is 4 equivalent to 0? No. No, it is not. 
So it will not execute this line, and it'll say, okay, I need to execute this line. So, so I'm going to try and figure out this value of k right here. But in order to figure out that value of k, I need to evaluate factorial, which means I need to establish a new workspace. And what variables do I need to keep track of in this new workspace? M, N, and K. What is the present value of N in this workspace? Three. So does everyone see that I'm going to do this a couple more times? Okay. So I'm going to do it a couple more times until I get to the top. So, uh, one more workspace. So, M, N, and K. The present value is 2. I need to figure out K. I need to make a new workspace. M, in and k, the present value is 1. Still, that's not 0, so I need to make a new workspace. <clears throat> m, n, and k. And now n is 0. OK, there'll be a brief interruption there. OK, so. <clears throat> So now, this is good. We're happy about getting here because what? It is one. Yeah, because, because finally, we have gotten to the place where we're not going to recurse any further. Right? So notably, when we're executing this workspace, n is 0. So now we ask, well, is 0 equivalent to 0? Oh, it is. So notice that in this particular workspace, this, this last one, this terminal 1, we're not going to make a value of k. We're ne we never need to determine a value of k because when n is 0, this block is never executed. So that means that, OK, here is m. And m is 1. And so now here's where the interesting stuff starts happening. So what happens to this value of m with respect to these workspaces? So where does m go? Okay. It goes to k. So this value of m now gets copied from this workspace into the previous workspace in the slot named k. So what happens is, is this value now moves here, and this value of k is now 1. And we've just evaluated right here. So now this value of m can be computed. It's the product of the present value of n and k. The present values of n and k are 1 and 1. So what's this value of m? One. It's 1. So this is 1. And then what happens to this value of m? It goes up to the next k. Right. So in fact, what, what really happens, in case you really want to know what the machine is doing, is that, is that this value of m is copied to slot k, and then this workspace is destroyed. It no longer exists anymore. So in time, this one has already been destroyed, and this one was just, now that I copy this here, this one is destroyed. So they're gone now. And that's good, because in this workspace, we're right here, and I can compute the value of m currently. So what is the value of m current? What, what will be the value of m? 2. 2, because it's the product of n and k. So this will be 2. And then what do I do with this value of m? I copy it to the previous workspaces, k. <clears throat> and that was 2. <clears throat> and that's good, because now I can compute this value of m. It's the product of n and k, which is 6. 
This value of m is copied to the previous workspace's slot for k. This value of m is the product of these two, which is 24. This value of m is now copied to the previous workspace. as 24. This value of m can now be computed as the product of n and k, which is 120. And then now here's, the la here's where it becomes different. What happens to this value of m? It gets output, but specifically what happens is, is that notice that on this command line, we did not, I, we just said fact of 5. We said, MATLAB, I want you to compute this. But notably, we didn't say where you want it to be computed. So where's MATLAB going to store it? Yeah? ANS. In the variable named ANS. Because all variables, all expressions that don't have an explicit storage location are stored into the location named ANS. So what's actually happening here is that the command line has its own workspace and as a result of this, there is a value a and s, and this value of 120 gets copied to a and s. And because we did not put a semicolon, MATLAB says, well, that a and s is 120. <clears throat> Yes? Uh, so how is, what, what is MATLAB going to do if we like told it to do fact of negative 1? On this definition? Yeah. yeah if it's just, it's going gonna, it's gonna, to, this function evaluation will crash. Okay. Yes? How does it know to put the first M in the for, uh, second K? Like how does it know to move M to K? Okay. So, 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 do you agree that this function has three variables, m, n, and k? So you agree in principle that every workspace has these values, okay? Now, what is the name of the output of the factorial function? M. But inside of this, inside of here, at this position, I'm naming, we chose to name the output of this call to the factorial function k. This is the output to this call of the factorial. It's named m, but here we're storing it in the value k. That's why it does this. <clears throat> Other questions? OK. So this is all right. OK, so now uh, <coughs> let's do, <coughs> pardon me, something a little bit, I, a different way to iterate that I suspect many of you will latch on to uh, more rapidly than recursion. So another way to do iteration, to do things over and over, is with something called a loop. It's something called a loop. So This is going to be called a for loop. <clears throat> okay, so if you were to type the following, if you were to execute the following snippet <clears throat> in MATLAB, if you were to write for So four is a keyword, and then I equal one colon five. So that's not a semicolon; that's a colon. <clears throat> and if you were to type something like x equal I. squared 
plus 1. Notably, I'm not putting a semicolon at the end of this statement. End. <clears throat> so if you were to execute this, this code one way or another, What will happen is that this line of code, this, will be executed once for each i value. One two, three, four, five. <clears throat> so this, that particular line of code that I'm pointing to in green will be executed exactly five times. Once for i is one, once for i is two, all the way up to five, including five. <clears throat> so what would, what would be, yes? If you reverse the order uh, around the colon, say five, colon one. We'll get to that. We'll get to that in just a moment. Yes? Is the default for an I to be commanded by one each time? We'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> we'll get to that in a moment. But for now, <laughs> for now, let's, let's imagine what this would do. So uh, remember the caret is the exponentiation operator. And I haven't put semicolons, which means that MATLAB is going to store this value of the right-hand side of the assignment into x, and then it's going to print out the value of x. So MATLAB would print something like this. It would say x is, well, what would it say the first x is? 2, right? Because that'd be 1 squared plus 1. And then it's going to type x is uh, 5, 2 squared plus 1. And then x is 10. And then x is 17, and then x is 26. So that's what MATLAB will print in response to that. Yes? Uh, you said that because you left off the semicolon that the program would store it in x, right? No. The reason, why it, the reason why it is storing it in x is because it says x equal that. If that was gone, it would be storing it in the variable named uh -huh. a and s. The, the lack of the semicolon causes the, this output to occur. If the semicolon was there, it would store the value in x and not print it. Yes? Uh, why is the first iteration 1? Should it be 2? <laughs> Everyone said 2. I think I said 2, and then I wrote 1. <laughs> so that's a righto by analogy to a typo. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so any question about this? So in principle, you know, I could, I could say, well, what if, I, what if I really wanted it to do this uh, for values 1 to 12, then what? Well, how would I make it, how would I make it do this all the way from 1 to 12? Right. Okay. What if I wanted it to do it for values 10 to 20? 10 colon 20. 10 colon 20. Okay. So, <clears throat> to understand that operator, the colon operator, <clears throat> If you were at the MATLAB prompt <coughs> and you typed 1 colon 5, so just the same thing that we wrote up there, 1 colon 5. This is an expression, and because there is no semicolon, the, the value of this expression will be printed, and because there's no left-hand side, this, the value of this expression will be assigned to what variable? A and S. MATLAB will respond with the following. It will say A and S is equal to 
one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so the 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 uh, prerequisite for this class is precalculus. So strictly speaking, you may not know what a vector is, but this is a vector, which is just to say it's like a it's like a number, an object which contains a multitude of numbers, five of them. Okay, if you were to type the following at the MATLAB prompt. <coughs> Three to seven. Would you please speculate? Yes. Does that mean that an array is an algorithmic matrix? Well, e yes, but we'll get to that later. This is also a matrix, a row matrix, if you like. Uh, so, can you please uh, speculate as to what how MATLAB would would respond to such a request? <coughs> so equals bracket three, four, five, six, seven. Very good. Okay, now to answer, as soon as I wrote this the first time, y'all, two, two of y'all asked a question. To answer your question, what if you wrote this? How would MATLAB respond? And this, you have no reason, unless you've experimented with MATLAB, you have no reason to know the definitive answer. And you, but. You may be surprised what happens. So what happens? Error. Not an error. Five, four, three, two, one. That would be a good guess. That that's a reasonable guess. That that's a reasonable guess. But all of those are wrong. <laughs> the answer is is that it'll say a and s equal this. The empty set, because what this actually means in MATLAB parlance is it means tell me all of the numbers starting with this one ending with that one increasing by one in between so if you say one to five it says one two three four five so now how many integers how many integers are greater than five greater or equal to five and less or equal to one there are none. none there are none now you might wonder okay what if I really wanted MATLAB to produce 54321? Now that's a reasonable request. I'd like for it to do that. Okay. To get there, we'll do one intermediate and say, okay, how about how about one colon four colon thirty uh, three, why not? No, how about 34? So now what, what does this produce? All the integers starting with one and then 34 are increasing by four each time. Yes, it is all the integers greater or equal to one, less or equal to 34, starting at one and incrementing by four. Yes? It can take reals, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So MATLAB will respond in this way. A and S is, well, 1, and then 1 plus 4 is 5, and then 5 plus 4 is 9, and then 13, 17, 21, 25, 29, 33, and now what? Bracket. That's it. Because if you were to increment by four one more time, you'd fall off the end. Okay, so in particular, if I was to change this 34 to a 35, the result would be exactly the same. And if I, was to ch if I were to change it to a 36, the result would be exactly the same. But if I was to change it to a 37, then I'd get one more. So now that I've written this, would someone care to speculate? How do you get MATLAB to give you 54321? Uh, 5 colon minus 1 colon 1. Very good. 
So 5 colon negative 1 colon 1. Now it'll get, yes? There is, but I'm not going to talk about that right now. <clears throat> there are such things. So here it would give you 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So what this syntax actually does at the top, what this, what this for loop syntax does, is it says for, and then it, you, you provide a name of an index variable, which is why this is usually called i, because the word index starts with i. For i equal, and then you give it a sequence of numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 5, 9, blah, 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 blah. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And what it will do is it will execute whatever is inside of the loop once for each element of the sequence and, per, and giving this variable the, the corresponding value in the sequence. Okay, so now that being the case, let's try and imagine how could we get MATLAB to write, uh, how, how could we write a MATLAB function to compute factorial? How could we do that? Using a for loop now. <coughs> yeah? Um, well, so if you want to do factorial of 5, you do 1 colon 5 and apply some multiplication function <coughs> to that array. Okay, I, I like it. So <coughs> let's, let's write a specific function. So uh, a factorial function with a loop. And I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it uh, left and right columns because we're going to make two implementations of it, one of them that that counts up and the other that counts down. <coughs> okay, so function M equal fact underscore up <laughs> for lack of a better name to N. So that means that we want to be uh, counting up. We want the loop index going up. Okay. So we're going to do this with a for loop. So I'm going to leave myself a little bit of vertical space here, and I'll say four. So what should I write next? I equal one colon n. I is one to n. Okay, I is a fine name, but if you don't like I, then you could use Q <laughs> or whatever you like. But what what can you what variables can you not use? M and n. M and n, right? Because those are those are reserved for other purposes. Also, for example, you cannot make a variable named function. MATLAB would not think that's clever. Okay, but you could make it, you could make it function with a Y, right? Function. Okay. So, we'll just use I. Okay, let's not be too creative here. For I is 1 to N. Okay, and then we want to do something clever in here. <clears throat> okay, so what should we be doing inside of the loop? What should we be doing? M is equal to what now? I times M. Okay. So let's think about this. Let's see if this passes muster. So when we're computing factorial, 
you know, in your head, right, when you're learning it for the first time in grade school or whenever it is that you learn it. You say, okay, I want to do five factorial. Okay, well, that's five times four, or no, how do, people start at the bottom, right, usually? Yeah, so you start with one. So one times two is two, times three is six, times four is 24, times five is 120. So you're sort of keeping track of what the current value is, right? One times two is two, times three is six. And you're multiplying by the current index. So I like this. Nevertheless, there's something that's not right about this definition. You don't have a starting value for n. Okay, what do you mean by that? The first time it runs <coughs> in MATLAB is going to be like, you're multiplying i by m, but what is m? Right. Yes? There's no zero. What do you mean, no zero? Okay, I like that too. Right. So what if n equal to zero is a legitimate input to the factorial function? And presently, if n, if n were zero, then we would be iterating for i is one to zero, which means that this, this loop would be an empty loop in the same sense that a set can be an empty set. This would be a loop that contains no iterations. So if we plugged in zero, it, it would blow up. I like that. So, so what were you saying? How do we fix it? Just use that blind space and say m equal one. Right, it's a good thing I saved some vertical space there, right? <laughs> so, so what this is, is we have to right here write m equal, in particular, what do we want it to be equal to? One. one. We want it to be one for two reasons, really. One reason, one reason is that if we plug in zero, we know that this loop won't execute. And also, according to the definition of factorial, what is zero factorial? One. 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 Also, what this loop is doing, what this loop is doing is it's making a product. It's making a product. And what is the identity of product? One. one. If we were performing a loop to construct a sum, what do you think we should initialize the accumulator as? Zero. Zero. Why? Because that's the identity of addition. Yeah, because that's the identity of sum. OK. So let's see if we can uh, model the execution of this function in a table. So now this execution model is slightly different in comparison to to this one. So the recursive definition, in a sense, says, OK, I keep recursing, so I'm making an entire new workspace, an entire new workspace, an entire new workspace. And then I'm copying values from this workspace to that workspace, copy, 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 copy. It's kind of a complicated execution model. Notice that this function never uh, does not recurse. It never recurses. So. The way I'm going to do this is I'm going to write a table. I'm going to write a table. And time, the time axis, is going to be the rows. So as, as time proceeds, that is to say, as execution proceeds, I'm going to add a new row. So what are the variables that are in this function? M and I. M and N and I. Right? <coughs> Gesundheit. No, n is constant, i varies, and m varies. <clears throat> so m, n, i. OK, so when we first enter the function, when we first enter the function, that's the very first thing that occurs. Which variables have, have a definition? N is the only one that has a definition at all. And it is, well, supposing that we're executing fact of 5. Then it would start out as 5. <coughs> Okay, the next thing that occurs 
is that MATLAB evaluates this expression 1 to n and it stores it somewhere in, hit, in a hidden place that is not a named variable and then it starts it starts giving i uh, the values of these in sequence so what will happen is that n is still constant at 5 and i obtains its first value here what's its first value? 1 ah no I, for, I forgot this that occurs first so i still doesn't have a value and now m is 1 that one occurs first so m has the value 1 n has the value 5 MATLAB evaluates 1 to n and stores the variable the the sequence 1 to 5 somewhere in a hidden place and then it gives uh, I its first value 1 <clears throat> so now this line will be executed the product line so I'll I'll write that as saying that this is the line on which the product occurs so M is going to have its value updated as the product of the present value of M and the present value of i. So that's 1 and 1. So the new pro so what's the new value of m? 1. 1. <clears throat> this is still 5. And this is still 1. <clears throat> so this is this is the beginning of the of the for loop. So here's the new top of the for loop. So control jumps back to the top and and MATLAB says, okay, now I'm going to give you the next value of i in the sequence. So what is the next value of i in the sequence? Two. It's 2. <clears throat> so i's value has changed. And so now we're on the line where the new product is being computed. The new value of m will be the previous value of m multiplied by that value of i. So what will the new product be? two. N is still constant. I is unchanged. <clears throat> Control jumps back to the top of the loop. MATLAB gives you the next <coughs> pardon me, the next value of i, which is 3. Then you jump into the body of the loop with the line that has the product on it. So what is the new value of m as a result of executing the line with the product? 6. 6, because it's, it's the product of, m, of this value of m and that value of i. So it would be 6 value of n is unchanged as a result and the value of i is unchanged uh, whoops the value of i is unchanged as a result of that line control jumps back to the top the value of m is unchanged when you jump back to the top the value of n is unchanged and then MATLAB gives you the next value of i isn't this really boring? <laughs> The next value of i is 4. <clears throat> and then you enter the loop body uh, and you execute the product line. <clears throat> and the new product is the product of that value of m and that value of i, which is 24. N is unchanged as a result and I is unchanged as a result. You jump back to the top of the loop. I'm going to have to continue up at the top. You jump back to the top of the loop. Uh, M is unchanged as a result of that. N is unchanged as a result of that. And MATLAB gives you the next value of I in the sequence, which is 5. <clears throat> I, I don't know. I even said out loud, <laughs> it doesn't change, and then 
Okay, so then MATLAB just gave us the value five for I. Now we execute, we enter the loop body, execute the product line. <clears throat> the new value of M is the product of the present value of M and I, which is 120. N is unchanged as a result of that, and so is I. <clears throat> and then what happens is, is MATLAB jumps back to the top of the loop and, uh, and notices what? There are no more integers. There's no more values in the sequence. And at that point, MATLAB ex the execution goes past the loop, and then it sees I'm at the end of the function, and MATLAB returns this value of M to the caller's location, wherever that may be. Interesting. So time executes like this. So this is the time axis. Interesting. Any question about this? So now let's do the exact same thing, except instead of counting up, let's count down and let's do it really quick. What time is it? We have like 10 minutes. We have 10 minutes. <clears throat> so how could we do this? Uh, counting down. What do you think would be a good name for the function? Fact down. How about fact down? Fact fall. Fact fall. <laughs> Simil similarly, for similar reasons, we need to initialize this value as 1. <clears throat> Again, we need to do a loop. But now, supposing that we want the index to count down, what is it that we need to write? Uh, N colon negative one colon one. Yes. So that means that tells MATLAB, give me, construct for me the sequence that begins with N decrements by 1 and ends at 1. So if we were to call this pre presently with 5, it would give us 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And again, And now let's be nice to ourselves and, and uh, maybe we'll evaluate factorial of three. It'd be slightly better. Okay, so if we were to, so this, this one was factorial up of five. Let's do factorial down of three. So again, in this function, there's three variables. And again, this table, the rows uh, are the time direction. So M, N, and I. So when we first enter, N is defined as 3 because we're evaluating fact down of 3, slightly smaller than 5. <clears throat> the first thing that gets executed is this thing. As a result of that line, M obtains the value 1 n is unchanged, and i still does not have a value. <clears throat> then MATLAB, <coughs> MATLAB evaluates this expression, expression and creates a sequence, 3, 2, 1, and stores that somewhere in a hidden place. It's got its own special name that we don't have access to. And what it will, what it will do is it'll say, OK, you want to enter that loop. I'll give you the first value of i. What is the first value of i? Three. Three. So that's f. I'm writing f for for loop. <laughs> then you enter the loop body to the line where you're going to 
make that product and MATLAB will say okay I will make a new value of M with the present value of M and I and the present value of I the product of those so what is the product three <clears throat> n is unchanged as a result of that i is unchanged as a result of that then you jump back to the top of the loop m is unchanged as a result of jumping to the top n is unchanged as a result of jumping to the top and MATLAB says okay I'll give you the next value of i what is the next value of i? Two and then you enter the loop body and when you enter the loop body to execute the line with the product it says okay the new value of m is the present value of m product present value of i so what is the new value of m? Six. Six. n is unchanged as a result of that i is unchanged as a result of that and you jump back to the top of the loop M does not change as a result of that. N does not change. And then MATLAB gives you the next value of I, which is 1. Then you enter the loop body. And the present value of M, the, the current value of M, the M that will be computed, is the present value of M product present value of I, which is what? 6. Six. N is unchanged as a result of that. I is unchanged as a result of that. And what happens now? It checks it one last time. Yeah, you, execution, you, you can imagine it like execution jumps back to the top and MATLAB observes there are no more values in this sequence and you proceed past the loop body to the end of the function and then out of the function and MATLAB copies the present value of M to the caller's position. Okay, lovely. <clears throat> so any question about this? Okay. So now, what we're going to do this week is obviously the re those recursion assignments that you did not complete last week, they're still open for business. But now we're going to do all of those same assignments again with one minor modification. What minor modification? We're doing them with four loops. Now you're going to do it with loops. Now you're going to do it with loops. So last thing is that one of the, one of the recursion assignments was such that you did not know how many times you needed to proceed through the loop. Right? I think I called it Pop goes the weasel or something like that. After the child's toy, do 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 and you're not, you know, adults can pretty much get it figured out, but children are often surprised like every time. They just they don't see it coming, you know. Okay. So so that particular loop structure that we just dealt with, the for loop, has a definite thing that's going to happen. You construct a sequence. Okay, and this sequence has finite length, and you're going to execute exactly once for every element in the sequence. Now, how do you deal? How do you have an execution which has a potentially unknown number of of executions? In such a case, you don't construct a sequence and ask MATLAB to do it, and there's a different syntax for it. So let's write it down. So this thing we're going to write is sort of a combination of a for loop, which you're familiar with, and a, uh, an if statement, a conditional statement, sort of both. So I'm going to write something and I want you to tell me what do you think would occur as a result. So here's a MATLAB snippet of code. I is 1. Okay, and here's a new keyword that's being introduced. While. So W-H-I-L-E. 
end. So now, just like, just like an if statement, when you make an, when you um, <clears throat> have an if statement, you have to put a conditional. So I'm going to say, how about while i is less than or equal to five? Do that. So now I'm going to put two lines inside of this loop body. I'll say mm, x is equal to uh, 3 times i, and i is equal to i plus 1. So notably, on the first line I didn't put a semicolon, and on the, on the second line I did put a semicolon. So what do you think this what do you think this block of code would do? If we were to if if MATLAB were to execute it. Any thoughts? Return like three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen. Mm hmm So what will happen is that you've made a variable named I and initialized it to one. And what happens is is that when MATLAB gets to this, it's going to check, ah. I'm going to look up the value of i, and, and if the value of i is less or equal to 5, I'm going to enter the loop body. I'm going to enter the loop body. So what will happen when you execute this is that x will be given 3 times 1, and then it will print that out because there's no semicolon. And then i will be incremented to 2. And then you'll jump back to the top and MATLAB will ask, is 2 less or equal to 5? Oh, oh, buddy, it is. And then it'll jump in here and say, okay, x is 3 times 2. And then it'll print out a 6 because there's no semicolon. Then it will increment i to 3. Okay, the last thing that will happen is that the last iteration is it'll ask, well, is 5 less or equal to 5? So is that true? Yes. It is. So you'll jump into the loop body and say, okay, x is 3 times 5, so that's 15. It'll print out x equal 15, and then it'll say I, I is equal to i plus 1. Well, at that location in time, i is 5, so i plus 1 is 6. So now you have 6. Control jumps back to the top, and now it asks, is 6 less or equal to 5? No. It is not. Therefore, this loop body will not be executed. So the reason why this is relevant is because in the Pop Goes the Weasel game, okay, you have to keep calling the function over and over and over and over and over until I give you the stop signal. I can't remember what it was. So, so I hope you can see how the while loop will, will do this for you. Okay, so see you on Thursday.